So it's trying to solve the question uh, when you have lots of different heterogeneous CPUs on an SOC or tightly bounded and you have multiple operating system environments. Uh, how do you deal with that? And hopefully we pretty soon get some slides here. Here we go. And uh, so uh, what we started to do was to do our own thing at Xilinx. So we come from Xilinx. And then we realized that this is really not any secret sauce here. How you send messages, how you uh, uh, do lifecycle management, start up something on another core, and so on and so forth, configure. That really should be something that's an industry standard. Uh, so what we did was that we looked around. We saw some uh, things out there in open source in Linux, things like Vert.io, uh, Remote Proc, RP Message, and we decided maybe we can build on that instead and try to interest some other companies to work with us on it. And that's what OpenAMP is really all about. And so currently we're working, we're getting, we're getting there. Is that full size for the screen? Let's say it is. Okay, I can go to the next slide. So we've been working now for four years, and uh, it started off as a working group within the Multicore Association. And uh, we've been working with uh, a bunch of different companies, and many of them are here, like SD Micro, uh, TI, uh, NXP, uh, Wind River, Micrium, uh, who else has been in there? Uh, ThreadX, uh, Linaro, of course, uh, Qualcomm a little bit, and so on. So there's a bunch of different companies that have been working on it. And so this, what we see here, is uh, one of our silent chips, just as a demo, how, how it works. So we have a bunch of different cores. We have a cluster of A53s, so that's four typically running Linux, sometimes with a hypervisor and then things on, on top of it. Uh, we have a bunch of R5s over here, two of them. Typically, you run maybe something that's more real-time uh, or something that needs to be safety certified on that one. And then, since we come from Silinx, we have what we call the programmable logic, or the FPGA. So in there, you can have a bunch of other accelerators or cores. We have something we call soft cores, called microblaze. So you can have quite a few of those there as well. So the question then is, how do you deal with all that? And it's not just the different various cores that you have to deal with. You also have all these different execution environments. So, for example, on, uh, on the Cortex-A, you have all these execution levels from EL0 to EL1, EL2, and EL3, right? Uh, so you have the user space, the kernel space, you have the hypervisor and the firmware. And you have trust zones, you have multiple uh, security environments as well. So the question then is, if these guys want to talk to each other, traditionally, you come up with something ad hoc for each of them, right? Then you have some shared memory, and you have to configure it somehow so that you can see the same pages, and then you do something ad hoc. So what we're trying to do is to, to standardize that at, at different levels. So, so basically answering these kind of questions, how can you configure these kind of environments in a, in a standard way? How can you manage the life cycle? Meaning, how can you start up something on another core? How can you take it down? Health monitoring, if something is happening, how can you get, uh, get notified about that? Those kind of things. How can you pass messages? Typically, so far, it's more control messages. Uh, the, the data plane is typically in, in a different way, but we're working on, on being able to do zero copy and big buffers and stuff like that to be more efficient there. Uh, how do you share resources? Let's say that you have a graphical uh, device, graphics card, for example, on the Linux partition, but then from your RTOS you want to access that. How, how do you do that? Uh, how do you simplify for RTOS vendors to port uh, for different SOCs? So you have SOCs from Silings, from SD Micro and TI and so on. How can, can we come up with an abstraction layer so that you can do the port once, basically, and just do that abstraction layer? So doing that, and as I mentioned, on top of the already existing products, that's really what we're, what we're all about, what OpenApp is trying to, to answer here. And uh, so there are a couple of sessions here. So Ed is going to go into some of the details of what we're doing on the Vert.io and the RP Message and the Remote Proc. 
Wendy is going later on to talk about lib metal, so that's a lower level abstraction layer. Uh, we're also working on some other things on configuration with device trees and so on. We're not going to cover that here. Uh, there are a couple of other sessions. Uh, tomorrow we have a meeting, an open app meeting at 11 o'clock. So anyone who is interested can are, are uh, invited to come and talk about that there. Uh, also on Thursday at 10.30, I'm doing a keynote where I will talk a little bit about this, but a little bit in a bigger, bigger picture kind of style there. All right, with that, I'll give it over to Ed to dive into the, uh, the lower level stuff. Thank you. Okay, so a fast executive summary of what we've done. So OpenAMP is an open source framework, and that's key for everything, to interact with heterogeneous systems on a chip. Heterogeneous meaning, of course, they've got, you, you don't just have one kind of core. You have one, two, three, infinitely many. Facilitating use of resources for complex designs. It's a, both a standardization effort and an open source project. Um, figure out what works, then make that a standard. Doing it the other way hurts. We've been evolving it slowly, so first the APU is master, we've just got the RPU as master. So instead of having everything run off the Linux, you can now run it off the, the real-time sa or safety certified cores and that makes safety people happy. Um, but we're working on authentication and so forth and decryption for executables, multiple types of memory, uh, coherency between systems, all those fun things that happen down at the low level. And then managing arbitrary executables, being able to load anything into, uh, right now we can load anything into the RPU from the APU and then ex actually managing our own implementation so that we, could, we can be update, update ourselves on the fly. A quick glossary because I threw a bunch of acronyms out there. I'm sure most of you are familiar with them, but I'm not going to go into any detail on it. Just give you a brief moment to get them in your heads. So, something, so the uh, heterogeneous architecture is practically forced on the people by um, the, the complicated chips that uh, Thomas was describing earlier. You can't run Linux on Cortex-R. You, you really can't run the same OS on the R's and the A's. You ca certainly can't run a conventional symmetric multiprocessing. GPUs are still abstracted out because well, they're GPUs. APUs are a good candidate for Linux. RPUs are a good candidate for an RTOS or safety certified system. You could solve this um, on a machine with, heter with hom homogeneous cores by either using a hypervisor or um, unsupervised AMP but the safety folks won't like the unsupervised AMP. So that's where we, that, that's where we sit. We have a heterogeneous architecture kind of forced onto us by the way the systems are architected. So we've got the APU running some cores, probably maybe if it's a hypervisor, you get a mix like this, otherwise they'd all have little penguins on them. And then you've got a couple of other cores, which could be the RPU, which are the A5 type cores, which could be running um, in lockstep or um, with a some form of limited AMP and and, and shared and, and partitioned memory with a very small shared region of some sort. But then you've got to talk between them, and that's the. Where the, that, and that's the question. So the interface is going to be very device specific. It, whatever works on it on ST probably won't work on a Zinc. And it's, the abstractions are more complicated because the underlying system is more complicated. So it would be nice to have an openly documented framework we could use to at least write the higher level software and only have to write the lower level software once. So these systems aren't that new. And 
people are, but people are trying to get closer access to the bare metal and be able to run, not have to rewrite their entire application stack every time they make a hardware decision. So Linux first came up with RP message and remote proc eight years ago. Remote processor, remote proc allows the, the Linux, uh, provides a driver framework for Linux to manage remote as in not part of the same SMP cluster hardware and remote processor ma messaging provides for a structured mechanism for communication. It's, I believe, 500, it's, it's a little over 500 bytes long. I don't remember the exact number. So it's short messages, but it's a way of exchanging messages and describing endpoints. So, yeah, 3.4, uh, introduced in 3.41, two responsibilities, management, starting and stopping remote processors, <coughs> and messaging, some way of getting there. This framework was originally limited, um, as it should have been. The Linux expected to be the master, no surprise there. And no framework provided for, rem for firmware on remote processors. And that's where OpenAMP came in, jumping a little out of order. Mentor actually, <coughs> provided the first implementation in 2014. And, with, with, and well, I don't know exactly the timeline. Mentor provided it and then Xilinx and Mentor partner, partnered to introduce it. It's a clean room implementation of the RP message remote proc framework under a BSD <coughs> license. And it expands the scope. So we can now run a master processor as on the RPU. Standardizes how, uh, how the OSs interact between, the li the li between Linux and so on, and whatever is on the RTOS or bare metal. Lifecycle APIs, inter-process communication, shared memory control. And it's under a certain, a limited set of guiding principles, open source implementation. Prototype it in open source. Make sure it works before we standardize it. And again, in keeping with the licensing model and so forth, business friendly so that everybody can build off this, whether they're building a proprietary system or not. And it, it consists of kind of a multi-layered set of libraries. There's the um, lifecycle management, interpro which controls the processors, and lo even loading firmware, which is one of the things that has taken a step forward from the, from the original designs. Interprocess communication, proxy operations, which is where we can, from, and this is Typically, from the Linux side to the um, to the RTOS side, we provide a proxy that allows effectively RPC from the real time side to the Linux side for access to things like complex things like file systems or graphics cards that um, you really don't want to try to fit in and uh, fit a reasonable sized graphics driver into an A5. And then libmetal, which Wendy will talk more about, which is a key abstraction layer in the whole thing because it provides a hardware and OS independent way, um, mechanism for accessing resources and including things like, so like sh memory, shared memory and um, software interrupts. And then we're ongoing trying to decouple, Wendy knows more about this process, where we are in the process. We decouple the remote proc and RP message implementations to allow being able to select one or the other for constrained environments. So, Linux AMP, no, su no support for firmware and remote processors, must run Linux, low level device code, 
Not so much there. User libraries, so OpenAMP is now user land libraries instead of a kernel, and adds the support for um, the more constrained OS environments. No longer needs to be Linux based, and with libmetal provides an abstraction layer to the hardware that um, allows for portability of the more application layer specific code across the different, pro the different kinds of processors. <coughs> so remote proc provides the APIs, hardware configuration, <coughs> power on off, power off, resource allocation so we can actually tell the remote what resources it has access to and configure it accordingly. Again, there's a, this is done over vert, we can do this over vert IO. So the messages are run as vert IO devices. I don't know if, I would suspect that pretty much all of you are familiar with vert IO. It, so it provides only the vendor agnostic um, forms of the messaging at this level. Remote proc for device specific device handling and live metal for some stuff. And a little bit more on VertIO, although I know some of you are extremely familiar with VertIO. <laughs> but it's a abstraction layer that provides for, it originally was designed to get to allow Linux to, to Linux devices to efficiently access hypervisor resources, but <coughs> the concept is just extremely useful to, to being able to provide a common device hardware abstraction layer for a whole variety of underlying implementations. And again, it's a standard, so. If you, so, you, so if you did it for Windows, if you did it for Windows, it'll probably the, 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 if you did a vert IO device that Windows recognizes, it might even be recognized by Linux without any modification. I'm going to, this is libmetal provides a set of common APIs for management and memory management and device access. It's, fun, it's, a, it's a fundamental piece of the overall OpenAMP architecture. It, if you take that away, you've got some nice abstractions with nothing to talk to. And I'm, I'm being deliberately brief here because I'm going to let Wendy talk more about it. <laughs> you want me not? To, want me to go on a little? Okay. So yeah, it's it, it can be done from Linux user space now with UFIO and the VFIO support in the kernel. Works on RTOSs. Works on bare metal. Handles all of those um, IR, IRQ and read and write from devices. So the the Primitives, so this, so on Linux versus <coughs> Metal I.O. writes probably just going to wrap itself around to some calls to read. But on uh, bare metal, it's probably just going to directly access a register <coughs> or, or three somewhere. IRQs, open, close. And then there's a set of shared memory things, which is, that which Wendy definitely knows more about than I do. And synchronization primitives. Because you do need to synchronize, we do need to synchronize between heterogeneous cores, which is exciting. Yeah. Remote proc, RP message, and VertIO all use libmetal underneath to ach achieve their goals. Remote proc startup. We've got a we've got a master running, and the remote process is standby or powered down. Load up some firmware. The uh, abs we have abstractions for doing that. So figuring it so you don't have to write the code every time to figure it out. You get somebody like Xilinx to write it for you once. Then <coughs> start the remote processor. Wait for an acknowledgement that it is up, and then establish a communication channel for control using remote proc.
then there's a similar process on the way back down where you would use remote proc to tell it to quiesce and then wait for the message that it quiesced or a timeout and then actually power it down. Now who, do, now, who gets all this magic done? <coughs> well, the vendor, which either RTOS or the SOC vendor is probably is going to be doing the low-level porting for their specific platforms, the, the libmetal interfaces, and providing whatever magic constants need to be in device trees and things like that. And then an application that includes a demonstration of the resource table, a couple of basic applications, the Linux RP message driver, and kernel modules and things for just showing how to use this. Because of course, the best, the, the easiest way to get something working is to have something that, that works that does almost what you want. Status, active evolving community project. It's on GitHub right now. We're moving, th th it's, a, it's still a, definitely a work in progress. Um, the, well, the source structure is, the protocol has been, pret is been pretty well stable with extensions. Yeah, IPC, the IPC mechanisms need performance improvements. Right now, they're suitable for relatively low volume control plane traffic, but um, people keep asking for, can I put video over it? Commercially available um, on most, uh, on quite a few things. Um, open source, Zephyr, Linux, FreeRTOS that we know of. Yeah, still a lot of porting work to do if we want to get it, if we want it universal domination. Support message passing, file system versus um, the proc, lock devices, graphics, again, those are via remote, via vert IO. Variety of, um, environments, kernel and user space, RTOS, Zephyr, and bare metal. Several processor architectures, secure and non-secure modes, threads and processes where they're supported, and virtualized guests and containers with the hypervisor. You know, if you, you should be able to expose a guest to RP message via vert.io on a hypervisor. It, it provides a, a, soft, a framework for access to these heterogeneous systems, loading firmware, communicating, and basically running the system in a platform agnostic manner. And that's where we are. And I think I have about two minutes to answer questions. Yes, sir? Is there a possibility to use like DMA to copy paste uh, uh, to transfer data from one CPU to the other or something? We are actively working on that. <coughs> are there any or uh, let's say uh, performance penalty for booting boot time uh, in our uh, uh, when we uh, port uh, this, these uh, libraries into the um, autos. Mm. For example, um, additional uh, initialization or something like that we need? Um, that's going to depend on um, the how the boot is structured because if it's waiting for, if, if it has to wait for the um, RP message to come up, there might be some additional delay. If it, oh. if it doesn't have to wait to do its key functions, then the delay, then of course the delay would be much less. It's, it, it will introduce a little bit of delay because it's more code. Mm -hmm. Just to add to that, uh, so 
there's multiple way of booting. One way is to have the, the firmware boot both partitions basically, and then you attach later on. So that's something we added, pretty, and then it doesn't affect boot time at all. If you feel that something like you boot or whatever, boot everything, or you can go and first boot, say Linux, mm -hmm. and then from Linux you start the RTOS, mm -hmm. for example. Then of course it will take longer before the RTOS okay. is up and running. Right? So it, it covers all those use cases. Okay, thank you. Regarding networking, is it? A, uh, I remember there is like a 512 byte with the RPC message. Is it possible to to like really get TCP or you know Ethernet between cores and you know, CPUs? That's not really a use case it was designed for. <coughs> we are looking at making the buffers more configurable, okay. but it's still not really. I mean, you, you'd, you'd be running tin cans and string kind of network performance. We actually, uh, I know one Artos vendors, they, so they've been using this, but they've been adding some stuff. So they are using graphics card and so on. So they, they've gotten quite a bit of performance, but what they do is that they pass over just a pointer to the memory where, the, where they have the big buffer. So that's something we're looking at adding into, uh, into the code as well. Th then you can get a little bit better speed, of course. Thank you all.